for coming. Um, the, um, as the members come in, I'll ask them to uh, make brief remarks if they choose. Um, but we really appreciate everyone's time. And uh, we want to do a uh, review of the draft 2010 strategic fire plan for California. Um, it's been reviewed and updated by the State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. The draft plan is out for public review uh, until April 5th. So this meeting is very timely. We invite the public and other concerned uh, citizens to uh, express their comments on the draft plan now. It, the plan incorporates the joint recommendations of the State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection and the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, our CAL FIRE uh, department. This collaborative approach to the strategic fire plan envisions a more adaptable document with periodic updates to adjust for changing conditions and revised priorities. The current fire plan was adopted in 1996, and the next comprehensive update uh, will take place in 2018, uh, unless the Board of Cal, uh, or CAL FIRE determine that it needs to be revised sooner. Welcome, Mr. Cook. You're in the right place. Come on up here. Thank you. Um, we just began, and I'll uh, ask you in just a couple minutes if you'd like to make some opening comments. Um, uh, we want to just uh, set up this hearing because uh, we believe the strategic fire plan should be a roadmap uh, for our firefighting strategy and for firefighting fire policy in general in the state. Uh, and my interest in this began uh, very directly in 2003 with wind-driven uh, wildland fires across California, especially in San Diego County. Uh, lives were lost, homes were destroyed, uh, and hundreds of thousands of people were displaced during mass evacuations. And all this occurred again in 2007. Um, in 2003, I was appointed to the Governor's Blue Ribbon Fire Commission. Uh, that group held hearings throughout the state. We heard directly from fire professionals, local jurisdictions, and leading scientists, including uh, the G U.S. Geological Survey uh, and experts in fire ecology and climate change. Uh, they told us that the typical wildland fire would now be 100,000 acres or larger, uh, that fires uh, due to uh, many different dynamics are going to be more frequent. Uh, larger in scale and more intense. Uh, they told us more needed to be done to make homes ignition resistant. Property owners needed to be proactive in establishing defensible space around their homes. And that we as a state had been very fortunate that these huge fires were largely in, uh, contained in the wildland urban interface and had not yet swept into major urban areas. Uh, the committee, the, this committee, the Joint Legislative uh, Committee on Emergency Management, had its genesis in the Blue Ribbon Fire Commission, uh, and we that recommended, uh, the commission recommended that permanent oversight uh, be established through the Joint Legislative Committee. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Fire Commission issued a series of recommendations, and over the last six years, the Commission has held regular updates looking at how state, federal, and local governments have responded to the recommendations. Um, my uh, chair, Vice Chair, Assemblymember Nava, and I have alternated uh, chairing the committee uh, for uh, every two years since uh, since 03 or early 04. Um, we have done, as I said, hearing after hearing. Assessment one after the 2003 uh, historic uh, fires took place in October of 2004. Uh, we have um, continued with a series of hearings that addressed the question of, is California prepared for the big one, earthquake, tsunami, wildfire, FUD, or act of terrorism? That was October of 2005. Uh, uh, in November of the same year, we looked at uh, how to prevent the next firestorm, followed up in the next month by uh, California's mutual aid uh, policy and a status report on that. In 2006, uh, we identified gaps in California's emergency preparedness. In 2007, we um, examined the California fire season, uh, emergency preparedness and response update, uh, particularly focusing on drought and climate change. Uh, in 07, we continue to look at wildfires uh, and um, 
preparedness, response, and recovery efforts in San Diego County. And uh, last year we looked at cost effectiveness in California's year-round firefighting capability. As I read the draft st strategic fire plan that is before us today, it appears that the results of those hearings and of uh, science-based fire prevention planning and emergency management concerns raised by CALEMA, formerly the Office of Emergency Services, are not fully incorporated in the draft plan other than by reference. And uh, although I await further information from each of the panelists, uh, my reading of the draft plan does not provide, to my uh, understanding, a comprehensive science-based strategy for addressing California's fire policy. After seven years of hearings and work on this draft plan, I do not see objectives or guidelines that incorporate updated policies on land use, defensible space, and fuels management that the state has already adopted. Nor do I see big picture leadership from the agencies to incorporate related state policies on climate change, carbon sequestration, and AB 32 compliance, all of which I think our, our fire policy has direct connections to. <clears throat> Additionally, coordination with other agencies is not addressed, mm -hmm. and I think that's critical for a effective statewide po policy planning, specifically uh, the strategic fire plan for the state of California should have formal links to the California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, the California Air Resources Board, the Department of Fish and Game, and the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing from the panelists. Um, I want to emphasize, as all of us do, that wildland fires pose a major emergency management challenge to our state. Uh, we are now roughly spending a billion dollars a year uh, on emergency fire activities. I'm hopeful that um, the panelists can address these issues uh, in this morning's hearings, describing exactly how this document will be used and what changes we can expect as CAL FIRE drafts its work plans and uh, the strategic plan is fi finalized. Um, thank you for allowing me to um, uh, give that opening statement because I really wanted to put the hearing in, in um, context. We think this is an important document, uh, but we think that it needs to be uh, further strengthened. Um, I welcome my vice chair, assembly member uh, Pedro Nava, uh, and also I'll ask each of the um, uh, assembly members that are with us if you'd like to make an opening statement, starting with uh, Mr. Nava. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, I, I think uh, you've done a very comprehensive and uh, eloquent overview of my thoughts as well um, in certain areas where there appears to be a disconnect. And I think that probably the best thing we can say is that this is a work in progress. Um, it is a draft, and it does provide members of uh, the committee with the opportunity to weigh in and to identify those areas that, that, uh, where work, more work needs to be done. Uh, and where there are uh, things that um, are lacking. And with that, I, I look forward to hearing uh, additional testimony. Thank you, Mr. Nava. Other members? Any? All righty. Um, I would like to call the public's attention uh, and the, uh, the uh, members of the committee to uh, we have a time constraint this morning. Uh, we will be leaving the room as close to 1145, maybe 1150 as we possibly can. That means uh, the first panel will uh, wrap up. We think uh, that's the one with the most detail, um, about uh, 1050. Um, the second panel will be uh, finished by about 11:15. Uh, the last panel by 11:30, and then we'll take public comment. If you wish to address the committee, uh, please see the sergeant, and uh, we will uh, have you uh, address the committee at the close of the third panel. And our first panel is invited to come forward. It'll describe how the strategic fire plan will improve fire protection and resource management in the state. We want to welcome uh, Ken Pimlet, uh, Deputy Director of Cal Fire, uh, George Gentry, Executive War Officer of the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection, Dr. Max Merritt from the Ecosystem Science Division of the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. You get the prize for the longest title. And um, uh, Frank Stewart, Director uh, of the Sierra Region of CAL FIRE Safe Councils. Welcome to all of you. Deputy Director, welcome, and we'll start with you. 
Good morning, members of the uh, the committee and public. Uh, again, Ken Pimlot, Deputy Director, Fire Protection for Cal Fire. Uh, we'd actually talked a little bit. Uh, I want to give just a brief overview of the planning process and the committee and what CAL FIRE's role has been. And then I will uh, defer to George Gentry with the board to kind of set the stage for what uh, laid the foundation for uh, getting us to uh, where we're at with this uh, 2010 draft. So the draft strategic fire plan, the 2010 plan that you have before you was, uh, was a cooperative joint effort between the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection and CAL FIRE. And it represents um, the basis for the steering committee that uh, uh, was uh, commissioned by the board uh, that represents local, state, federal government, fire and land management agencies, resource professionals, the scientific and research community, and a variety of stakeholders. It was felt very strongly um, based on the efforts from the 1996 plan and some of the things that worked and didn't work, that it was critical for this plan to be successful, that it needed to be launched from a foundation of stakeholders that would be involved in uh, implementing uh, that plan. So the committee, the steering committee has been key uh, to developing the foundation for the plan that the board and the department will ultimately work together to implement. Uh, as the committee met, uh, they established an overarching vision for the plan, and that's where all of the subsequent um, uh, goals and objectives evolved from. And essentially the vision uh, was to guide the state toward a natural environment that is more resilient and man-made assets which are more resistant to the occurrence and effects of wildland fire through local, state, federal, and private partnerships. And it was very clear from the beginning, and I think everybody on the committee realized that uh, California has to live with fire. It's not going away. So our, all of our strategies had to be geared toward uh, how can we uh, work towards a plan that enables the state to live with fire. Uh, Ultimately, the plan uh, evolved is comprised of seven main goals and objectives that support the vision and are organized in a, se in a sequential flow, uh, each building upon the previous one. Uh, the goals include hazard identification and data collection, land use planning, collaborative fire protection planning, public education, fire prevention, fire suppression, and post-fire responsibilities. Uh, once the plan was released in draft form, uh, CAL FIRE is reviewing those goals and objectives to develop uh, priorities within the department and measurement criteria by which uh, to implement and measure progress. Uh, ultimately, CAL FIRE will develop work plans and ongoing reporting criteria with the board to evaluate progress regarding implementation of the plan. Unlike previous plans, the 2010 fire plan is a dynamic document that is designed to be flexible in response to the unknown budget pressures, environmental climate changes, and other social and political factors that influence uh, that process. Although it is generally agreed that Earth's climate is changing, uh, it's unclear what the far-reaching impacts of these changes will be on weather, vegetation, and the frequency and intensity of fire in California. Uh, the plan will provide the framework based upon the best and most current science to successfully address fire issues in a changing environment. And from CAL FIRE's perspective, uh, it is critical that we have a plan that does mul provides multiple um, benefits. One, it's, it's, it's general in nature because it's the overarching document from which individual unit and community-based planning efforts uh, will evolve and be supported. Uh, it also provides that framework for CAL FIRE to identify what resources it has uh, existing to accomplish those goals and what resources it needs. And that's the critical piece of the prioritization that we're uh, going through right now is to determine what can we do with what we have and what things do we need to look for, either coming back to the legislature, either putting in budget change proposals, or what are those things that we need to do to further increase our ability to accomplish that uh, at all levels, from the data collection part in the beginning to the fuels treatment to the, the supporting the, the, the core scientific research that we need to validate the premise by which we're operating under. Obviously, the emergency response piece to ensure we have all of the assets, uh, the training, and all the things that we and resources we need to respond to the fire. Uh, and at the end, all the things we need to ensure post-fire recovery uh, so that we are taking advantage of uh, fires that have occurred and putting back a, a management structure or encouraging landowners to um, 
manage the landscape that they have post fire to ensure that we've built in resiliency for the future. So with that, that'll conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from uh, all the panelists and then uh, we'll take questions from the committee or comments. So I think, let me see if we're going in order. Uh, Mr. Gentry, you're going to uh, speak next. Uh, thank you, Senator. And, and I want to say uh, straight out that uh, your comments at the beginning were really appreciated because if there's one thing that we are trying to achieve with this draft document is getting that kind of constructive comment back so that we know what we're communicating. It's hard to know sometimes. When you get to be a subject matter expert and when you delve into the details, you don't know how it's translating when you put it out. You've identified several things that will be very uh, helpful for us to work for when we work on this plan as we go forward. And I, I want to tell you right off that I've appreciated your support and the support of your staff as we've moved forward on this thing. Thank you. Um, I'm joined here today by Chairman Stan Dixon, recently reappointed. He's in the audience, as is... Uh, Welcome. As is, uh, for the most part, my entire staff. Uh, but uh, the uh, this fire plan was something that we started working on immediately. In 2003 is what you brought up. That's when we started really focusing on this. It was hard to move forward. There are so many things. The, the, the landscape changes so quickly. Um, it received added importance after 2007 and 2008, and with the issues surrounding climate change, it becomes incredibly important. We are going to see the landscape alter and change over time, uh, and we don't know and we can't predict all of these things. We've done a lot of extensive review on the previous plan. It was a good plan. It was visionary, but we're not communicating to the public exactly what it is that we want to see accomplished because we're getting these kinds of questions back. Costs are going up. We can't really communicate effectively if, if the public doesn't understand what it is we're trying to accomplish. Sure. What we decided uh, based on that review was um, there are several issues. First of all, there's the issue of responsibility, particularly at the local level and the individual level. They have to be our willing partners and collaborators on the, on this issue. Everybody has to realize that it's not just a department problem. It's not a board problem. It's not a legislature problem. It's all of our problem. We live in a fire-prone landscape, and that is the bottom line. And we need to learn how we live in that kind of a landscape, how we adapt to it, how we place ourselves in these particular <coughs> positions. That's critical. And that's kind of the cornerstone of this plan, is that local collaboration is vital, vital if we're going to have any success at all. If the local communities are not bought into what we're doing, it will not achieve what we want it to achieve, period. That's just as plain as I can state it as far as the fire plan goes. We identified several issues out of a workshop we held with uh, subject matter experts from the UC system. We knew that, that that state fire plan in 96 was one of the most visionary documents ever, but there's a paradox involved here with mitigation. As hazards to assets are mitigated, more people build into these areas, and then you're going to have to mitigate further. So we have to address how we smartly plan these things in the future. We can do that collaboratively. There's also an important issue here, too. People tend to think of assets at risk as mainly uh, people and infrastructure. And those are important, there's no question. Human safety is the most important issue that we can address. But let's not forget, there's other assets involved here, including the fact that 80% of the water of this state originates on the forested landscape. And we have to do all, our, all we can to preserve that water resource because as big an issue as fire is, I'm pretty sure water trumps us right now. So, so the, the health of the watershed is, is critical. Yes, absolutely. Fire safe councils are vital to how this works, how this works on the ground, how the local collaboration works. Um, the fire plan should be a medium for collaboration. It should be bringing together all the disparate parties, whether they be federal, state, county government, local landowners. We all have to work on this problem together. And we have to have a better communication strategy. We have to be able to communicate these things so that people understand and accept that they live in a fire-prone landscape. Fires, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when and what kind of fire can hit the point. We're trying to develop resiliency. There's resistance that you can build in into your own structure, 
But what we're trying to do is be able to bounce back from these catastrophic occurrences. That's where we have to invest our efforts, and that's the vision of the fire plan is to move forward in those areas. Um, Ken's already hit upon the goals, and I want to thank the department. Uh, this past year, new director uh, Del Walters has embraced this fire planning process. He's provided us with people like Ken and his staff to help us move this thing forward, and it has really made a difference. It's this having that kind of cooperation between the board and the department makes all the difference in the world. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moritz. <clears throat> Well, thank you for uh, for having me here. I appreciate it. And um, I guess to start off, I, I would also, um, I think I'll probably echo some of, of your concerns. Um, I want to be critical but constructive. Uh, I think that there are some, um, there are some well thought out goals of, of fire resilient landscapes and, and fire resistant communities and coexisting with fire that are, are part of the document, but they don't necessarily translate all that well into the objectives. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, and so some of the comments I want to make, and I'm going to actually read this, which I rarely do, so I apologize if it's choppy, um, because you wanted written testimony, so I, I'm going to read this. Um, as an academic and a scientist, my aim in being on the Strategic Fire Plan Steering Committee has been to incorporate the latest science and to take a long-term, broad-scale view of fire-related problems and solutions. Getting science-based knowledge out into the planning and decision-making arenas is one of my key duties and challenges uh, in my position at UC Berkeley. That's part of what we try to do, get science out into the hands of people who need to make decisions. So I'm honestly grateful for uh, having been invited to participate in the, the fire plan update. The strategic fire plan could be a major opportunity for us to change course and to take advantage of a huge amount of fire-related research over the last decade. I've contributed small pieces to that, but there's a lot of new knowledge. We might finally come to grips in a strategic, sustainable, and comprehensive way with the fact that we live in an ecologically diverse and fire-prone environment. <clears throat> Such an understanding is crucial, given that different habitats up and down the state have different requirements for natural intensities and frequencies of fire, and we continue to fragment and develop on these landscapes. <clears throat> Through careful fuels management activities, it is possible to alter fire behavior when fires do occur, but success varies greatly in different vegetation types and under different weather conditions. I think you know that very well from Southern California. To a certain degree, fires are as inevitable as floods, earthquakes, and droughts, and our strategy for coexisting with fire should reflect this certainty. Unfortunately, solutions to California's fire-related problems are complex and may require new mechanisms for leapfrogging past our current situation. There's a real urgency here. The difficulty of these problems should not allow us to proceed with business as usual and to put off hard decisions for the next generation. There's already fairly conclusive evidence of climate change effects on fire activity in some western forests over the last few decades. Because further climate disruptions will lead to greater fire activity in many locations, we must start addressing the long-standing issue of how and where we build our homes and communities in California. Responding to wildfires that affect human developments also co costs us all vast sums of money each year. Furthermore, because fire is one of the few processes that links almost all of the natural resources and public goods that we care about, air and water quality, biodiversity and habitats, public infrastructure and carbon cycling, fire cannot be addressed in isolation or through simplistic tech fixes. We must move past a narrow mindset of, one, fighting fires when they do occur, and two, fighting the vegetation before the fire occurs. So how well have we done in this draft? I view it as a major compromise between where we need to go strategically based on current science and what CAL FIRE and the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection see as their mandates and statutory limitations. To many people, it will reflect quite traditional concerns of fire management before and during fires. Although it's largely limited to fire and fuel management associated with the wildland-urban interface or intermix issues, there's an encouraging new emphasis on building and maintenance of structures to facilitate more fire-resistant communities. This is an improvement that we can be proud of, and California is relatively progressive in this front. 
given the apparent need for compromise, as well as the current focus of the entities crafting and abiding by the new fire plan, many fire-related issues may simply have to be addressed through other mechanisms. So I'm still curious whether the goal should be to transform this or to, to think about what other mechanisms there are. <clears throat> There's no attempt to transform pardon? the plan yeah. at, or, or use some other mechanism for... To address some of these larger scale issues. The plan is good at some things, but some of these other issues that are left untouched, I'm wondering if, if they can be dealt so with in this plan. So rather than expanding the scope of the plan, maybe uh, do some, some additional uh, kind of either planning or uh, you know, planning and research together? I don't know. Possibly. I, Maybe. And, and I think this is a great topic for discussion. I just, I don't think we need to s scrap the plan because it's a, a lot of hard work and, and there's good progressive things in there, but it leaves a lot out. So I'm not sure if we, this plan can be a focused plan and, and some other venue might be used to deal with these other issues. But I just wanted to raise that. Um, there's no attempt to address the mismatch between local decision-making about future development and its long-term statewide impacts. For example, the financial and environmental impacts of ongoing fragmentation of fire-prone wildlands, or, and you may be familiar with this, allowing, say, for example, shelter-in-place mm -hmm. plans to get around development restrictions. This is actually happening in San Diego. Um, these aren't, these aren't touched on in the, in the plan, really, these long-term, broader-scale issues. There's no emphasis on restoration and maintenance of, of natural fire cycles, sometimes in naturally high-intensity events, where this is important for habitat quality and biodiversity. The beneficial use of fire to reduce hazardous conditions, primarily in forests that once experienced frequent and low-intensity events, is also missing. The fire plan leaves integral linkages between fire and carbon, fire and water, fire and air, Fire can have both positive and negative impacts on all of these to be handled elsewhere. So in summary, the new strategic fire plan is a compromise. The problems are complex, and it embodies the work of several dedicated people, sometimes with vastly differing views, over many months. The document reflects some step forward in our scientific thinking about how to live in a fire-prone environment, but it is not the bold and synthetic, and I'm not going to say blow up the boxes, because that's just not okay, approach that may be required to achieve a sustainable coexistence with wildfire. As a scientist and a Californian, I'm still optimistic and eager to see how we will handle fire's complex interactions with many of the public goods and natural resources of our great state. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then uh, Mr. Stewart, I think. Yes, you're going to wrap up the panel, and then we'll go to members. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Frank Stewart. I'm a registered professional forester with 41 years of experience relating to the management and protection of private and national forest lands in northeastern California. For the past 10 years, I have served on the board of directors for the California Fire Safe Council, representing the Sierra region. I appreciate the opportunity to come before this committee to provide my input on the urgency of implementing the 2010 Strategic Fire Plan for California and to thank the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection for allowing me to serve on the Fire Plan Steering Committee that drafted the vision goals and objectives of the plan that are intended to improve the fire protection opportunities for citizens, communities, and watersheds from the growing threat of catastrophic wildland fires in California. To appreciate the pace and scale of this growing problem, you need to understand that since 2000, seven western states of Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, and Utah have established nine new state records for annual acres burned by wildland fires. And we in California have the unique distinction of suffering through three of these nine new records with 1.1 million acres burning in 2003, 1.5 million acres acres burning in 2007, and our new record of 1.6 million acres burning in 2008. In addition to establishing state records, these fires are also increasing in intensity and severity of burns, which are having significant impacts on rising costs of fire suppression activities at both the state and federal level, 
creating greater risk and threats to our firefighters, communities, and citizens, degrading streams and watersheds, killing wildlife, and destroying wildlife habitat and timber resources on both public and private lands. The message is quite clear. The catastrophic fire problem in California is getting worse, not better. And state and federal firefighting and land management agencies must focus their limited non-suppression funding and resources towards the collaborative development and implementation of strategic and cost-effective hazard fuel reduction and forest restoration projects that maximize the protection for communities and watersheds. As outlined in the strategic fire plan, the local collaborative forms that bring the key players to the table for the development of this cost-effective strategy are the county fire safe councils. And the strategic blueprint for implementing the projects on the ground are their collaboratively developed county fire plans. The California Fire Safe Council is mobilizing Californians at the local level through educational and actual pro action programs to protect their homes, communities, and watersheds against the growing threat of wildland fires. And the 2010 Strategic Fire Plan correctly clarifies the individual responsibilities, obligations, and roles that each of us have in this process. There are over 190 fire safe councils throughout the state and they are comprised from citizens, homeowners, local businesses and professional representatives from city, county, state and federal fire, firefighting suppression and land management agencies. The National Fire Plan was started in 2001 and Congress funded through the federal agencies of the U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service and Fish and Wild Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, 10 years of community assistance and fire protection grants for California. Senator Feinstein has been a continual champion of the efforts of fire safe councils and she has worked with Congress and the administration to sustain a 10 year average of $9.5 million annually of national fire plan grants for California. In addition to these funds, federal funds, Cal Fire has contributed another million and a half dollars per year of Prop 40 funds and wildland urban interface grants that they receive through their participation in the State Foresters Association. A new participant to the grant funding process in the Sierras is the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. Although these funds are urgently needed and greatly appreciated at the local level, they only meet 35% of the annual $31 million of funding requests submitted by fire safe councils for the protection of communities and watersheds throughout the state. Hopefully through the efficient implementation of the 2010 strategic fire plan, state and federal agencies and the legislatures will better understand the urgent need for a sustainable source of funding for collaborative efforts of fire safe councils in California. Again, thank you for holding this hearing and allow me to provide my input. Thank you, and we appreciate you being here. All right, uh, let's uh, take some questions from the panel. Uh, uh, Deputy Director, um, Mr. Pimlot, I'd like to start with you and just uh, kind of set us up with this process of the strategic plan and uh, give us your comments as to why, um, as I understand the timeline, um, this has been in preparation in a sort of a two-stage effort of review and then the new document since uh, 2003. And uh, why, wh how much effort and detail goes into seven years of, of planning for a document that is, I don't want a longer document, but it's, it's 20 pages. I mean, it's kind of a... A, an, out, an outline in some respects of your, of your, I guess, basic objectives. It's, um, it's a long time in coming, and I wonder if you want to comment on the nature of the work uh, and what the process is here on out to get it adopted. Absolutely. Uh, well, the, the plan is uh, updated every or revised uh, every 10 years, and so the 1996 plan theoretically would have come back up, you know, in 2006, and that's as uh, George Gentry pointed out that's when the uh, the board and the department started looking at a review of the 96 plan and determining um, is this the direction we want to go with the next revision or did we want to identify what worked and what didn't work. Um, it took um, several years combined with obviously new data from the 2003 and subsequently 2007 and 8 fire seasons to really get the ball rolling for the direction that we wanted the plan 
collectively wanted the plan to go. Um, I think uh, it was recognized right from the get-go by everybody on the steering committee that we can't live with a plan that is bound, rigid, uh, because of the dynamic nature of California at all levels that everyone agreed we wanted a plan that would evolve that wouldn't wait till 2018 to completely review and revise that we wanted every year or more frequently to be able to come back and look at and see are the things working or are they not working and if they're not working let's retool and go a different direction or let's reevaluate and matter of fact we even joked about the fact that it's going to be a loose leaf bound document because we want to be able to we don't want the impression that we're stuck with something for 10 years. We want to continue that process. Uh, so that's the premise that the committee took as it launched forward. And, and Max is, is right on. Um, when you have a group representing such a cross-section of the state, all facets of the community and the stakeholders, uh, having to reach consensus and compromise uh, to have a document is critical. And this document is really at that 50,000 foot level. It is not the document that um, an individual fire safe council, uh, a local CAL FIRE unit, um, or other entity can walk in and it provides them the direction they need to do their business day to day. It's to provide that framework or the outline, and, and that's exactly why it's currently at an outline format, to build the more specific plans that are tailored to that local level. Um, what works in Shasta County or Plumas County may not work in Riverside County or in San Diego. So this is to provide that overarching framework, sort of that glue and the sideboards by which uh, the local level planning efforts can, can develop from. Um, California, as you know, is very diverse, and the challenges that we face are we need to get the state looking at and moving towards, because fire is a reality, it's not going away, we need to be able to look at what are the beneficial uses of fire, where does it play that role, but at the same time, we have a public expectation that we're going to protect lives, property, uh, and assets, and so we've got to maintain a strong um, response and a, a strong response to the public to ensure we're doing that while at the same time trying to introduce uh, areas where uh, we can implement some of these fire strategies that can um, that you know may again take into incorporation those beneficial uses you know uh, one of the uh, main um, I guess uh, one of the bedrock uh, outlines of, of the strategic fire plan is you know how much do you have to do? And I, I noticed in uh, in the draft that uh, when you addressed um, the mission of the of Cal Fire, um, I think you right in the beginning say something along the lines of um, oh there it is in in concert with the mission of the board the mission of Cal Fire is to serve and safeguard the people and protect the property and resources of California. And I know I was admonishing you to think big picture, but that might be a little too big. It, it sounds like you're becoming the state fire department in a way. And so if you're at the top of the fire prevention, fire suppression food chain, which I think you are, then um, the, the, the stance the department takes uh, really impacts all the way down to the locals. Uh, and um, so... If 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 we're going to if the if the department's official policy is to get out beyond the the uh, state responsibility areas, isn't that going to lead to uh, a lot more cost for the state and a lot more um, uh, tension or impacts with the locals? Um, I think unless we're just going to pick up the tab for everything, <laughs> certainly would be advocating yes. that. Yes, <laughs> get a lot of support from the locals there. Yeah, um, I think that uh, the department's statutory responsibilities for state responsibility area. And that part is clear within um, the statute, the Public Resources Code, the, the 33 million acres of, of wild lands under the under Right, the but you do, you do open it up to some um, guesswork in your, in, on page one. Well, actually, well, the, the key piece that three, we right. recognized in this plan is that fires don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries. And right. while, yes, our responsibility between the board and the department is to ensure we're implementing uh, 
a fire plan on state responsibility area, we cannot do that without incorporating local and federal uh, land ownership um, and jurisdictional policies and uh, cooperation. Because again, uh, and this goes right back to the core issues that Max talked about, the planning that has to occur at the local level isn't always occurring on state responsibility areas, occurring in, occurring in local responsibility, and it's occurring on federal lands, on Forest Service land, right. and, and those policies can be in direct conflict with what we're trying to achieve. So unless we can engage all of those parties at the lowest possible level, we will not be able to implement the fire plan on state responsibility area. Do we have a, a good uh, understanding of what uh, the acreage is on our state responsibility areas? Has it been updated? We're currently going through the review, the five-year review of SRA as we speak of state responsibility. We'll have that. We'll be finalized. We'll be back before the board this summer, and we'll be finalized by the director and the board uh, late this fall. Okay. And so then that will be an update of the SRA boundaries? That is correct. Okay. By, by the fall? Yes. Um, okay. And then... Um, uh, let me go to uh, Assemblymember Gilmore and the other members, and then we'll um, take questions. Let's go down the line. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, an observation here. I, I, there were some very, very uh, – this has been very informative, and I, I want to thank uh, the comments made by uh, Mr. Stewart here uh, in, in, in your assessment of the catastrophic fires that California is experiencing. Um, I, uh, probably one of the most interesting uh, experiences I've had in the 15 months I've been in the legislatures here is I had an opportunity to, uh, to tour um, in, in Weed up in Sh uh, Shasta County, uh, the forest up here, and it was a re really an educational experience uh, for me and seeing that <clears throat> I, I personally don't think we're doing a very good job on a statewide level of, of having the opportunity to, to harvest uh, some of our of our of our of our forest, which creates an, an incredible timber box, if you will. Um, going through on, on these tours and seeing uh, the inability to actually go in and harvest some of the trees, all the fuel that is on the on the on the ground of the forest, they're, they're just timber boxes. Given uh, the fires that we're having throughout the state and and some of the other states that are mentioned, but more specifically here in California. I was amazed to find out, and, and, and uh, this is kind of a side issue, but in 2000 in California, we had about 138 lumber mills in California in, in the year 2000. Currently, we have about 35 lumber mills left in the state. Uh, we are, we are a, a lot of our timber is being imported from Oregon, from Canada. We're losing jobs here, but more importantly is the cost to the taxpayers to fight these catastrophic fires. We're our own worst enemy here in California, in my estimation. I believe it was Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gentry had, had mentioned the importance of educating the public. Um, what method are we going, uh, are, as a fire service, or what are we going to do as a state to educate um, the people of this state and for us as legislators to wake up here and make it easier um, we had a huge battle over timber harvest plans this year on a on a on a piece of legislation um, to allow uh, us to go into these forests and and harvest them and replant them it's actually healthier for a forest and it makes the job of cal fire and the firefighters throughout the state of california much easier to make our safe our state safe and the catastrophic losses could i could someone Respond to that if, if they if they would. I, I would like to start. I know Frank's got some choice comments to make on it, but I think a great a great case study that absolutely uh, exemplifies what you're talking about is the, the case study for Lake Arrowhead. Lake Arrowhead used to have a lumber mill, and it shut down. And then uh, under drought conditions, they suffered Im immediate and massive dieback in all their forests. They were not interested in harvesting, and they had no economic way of doing it. And we, I think we all saw the result. Uh, in terms of educational uh, opportunities, although that's a little bit drastic, that's a pretty good one right there. Um, since that time, Lake Arrowhead's been very aggressive in getting rid of their um, 
their bug kill and their dead trees and their and uh, their burn trees. But their main solution has been to stick it in an air curtain burner and burn it up. A key policy uh, of the board is to develop at least biomass facilities up and down the state. This comes back to your original point about engaging the California Energy Commission. That is imperative in order to do these kinds of treatments cost effectively. But I'm going to let Frank carry on from here because I know he's got a couple of points he wants to make about this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gilmore. Your, your concerns are very valid, and I think the board really recognizes that, that there are federal lands and public lands in the state of California, and, and they're very controversial on some of the management activities of the national forest. Uh, that, to me, is one of the real advantages of a county fire safe council that brings your federal, state, and local entities to the table to develop a plan. And in the packet with my testimony was a sample of what's called a base map for just Plumas County, which did show projects projects on private and public lands in that county. And what we maybe need to think about at the state and the federal level is to protect those projects so we can get them done. They're not par se timber sales. They're called timber sales because that's the only contracting authority the government has to put these projects up. What they really are are hazard fuel reduction and forest restoration projects. So these are pilot projects in Plumas? Uh, no, they are just projects that the County Fire Safe Council okay. has been working with the agencies in Lassen County. Uh, they bring the projects in, the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, even the state forest lands up there in Shasta County, bring in their projects along with the industrial landowners and the communities. And it's put on a map okay. that really shows your, your what's going... Your packet is excellent. And just tell me briefly your second point, and then I want to ask a little follow-up well, on this idea. The second point is, is, is we need to address, and I think the plan tries to do that, there is an economic entity that needs to be addressed in the state fire plan because without generating revenues to help pay for some of these costs, then it's all coming out of uh, budgets. And to me, there's a great opportunity, especially on the federal lands, to explore these projects with what's called stewardship contracts between fire safe councils and the government that allows you to reduce generate revenues on a per acre basis by reducing the fuels and use those revenues to do more for, more work on non-industrial private property. So I think there's some opportunities to explore uh, what Mr. Yeah. Gilmore talks more, about. More revenues is key. Um, uh, let me, uh, on the idea of for, forest thinning, fuels management, whatever uh, the d different phraseology is, and replanting, Mr. Gilmore mentioned, then you have the opportunity for carbon sequestration, correct? Because the correct. growing trees sequester more carbon than correct. the others. So what, what is the Board of Forestry doing on both those counts? And uh, what do will we see more of it in the strategic plan? Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of ways that we address this. And yeah, we can address this more uh, explicitly in the strategic fire plan so that the public understands where we're coming from this. But as an example, currently we're working on a, a fuel modification uh, modified THP, which would be a little less uh, uh, documentation necessary if you're doing some kinds of thinning to correct a forest health situation. Uh, to, in order and didn't we get we got federal money after 2003 to begin some forest thinning and fuels management in Southern California, yes. you know, like yes. San Bernardino and yes. Riverside? Yes. Has that money uh, flowed consistently or did it dry up? What are we doing? Uh, Frank would be better to answer. Well, that was the uh, average of about nine and a half million That's dollars per year that Senator Feinstein's been. That's right. So that it continues to come in, but it not has at been the coming level, in for ten years. Not at the level that we need. Okay. Uh, uh, Miss Kill, if I might, uh, your, your comment uh, about carbon sequestering—it's really forestry 101. Carbon is nothing more than wood, and good forestry of thinning the stands, reducing stocking levels to where a crown fire comes to the ground, one, and two, a ground fire cannot get into the crown. That spacing of trees increases the growth. The regional forester, that's why it's important to understand there's federal land and private land in California. Currently in the Sierras, regional forester Moore, we have a meeting with him next week and down here. Uh, one of the efforts that he's trying to do is to raise, right now on the 12 million acres of national forest land in the Sierras, they're only reducing fuels on about 100,000 acres a year. He wants to elevate that level to a half a million acres a year, or we will never address the pace and scale of the, of the fire problem. And so in that process, thinning, forest thinning, from a structure standpoint of the stand, is urgently needed 
and it is also called carbon sequestration. That's another opportunity that we need to explore. Let me go back to Mr. Gilmore, and then anyone else, gentlemen? Right. Mr. Gilmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just briefly, and I'll close with this. We're our own worst enemy here. Uh, if, if we would get out of the way, we, the, the government, and let the, the professionals here working with forestry uh, to address these issues, instead of closing these lumber mills and losing jobs and we're importing our lumber into the state, we, we can supply 50% of the lumber here in California, but yet we're importing it from Canada and Oregon. It doesn't make any sense. I have... I represent the, the, the poorest district in the state. The last lumber mill in, uh, in, in uh, Tulare County, which is Terrabella, which em employs about 220 employees in the last 18 months has reduced this family-owned business of 80 years to half of their employees. We need to wake up and help the people working together so that we can reduce these catastrophic fires, help our economy, and put people to work uh, thank you. That's what we're doing here today. I, I thank, thank and, you. And, uh, well, you know, the... Eight day clock on this. Beg your pardon? Yeah, I said I'm well tighter than eight-day clock. <laughs> well, you're, you're, uh, you're maintaining so far, Mr. Gilmore. But you're right. I mean, this is... You're right to the extent that that's what we're doing here today. That, uh, you know, over the... Uh, as I recounted in my opening statement, we've probably had a dozen hearings on various aspects of fire safety in California. And... Uh, the forestry issues, uh, forest thinning, carbon sequestration have come up over and over again. We want to see the agencies move toward, uh, as Mr. Gentry said, more public understanding of these issues out there and here in the legislature because we're not, we're not getting there yet. Mr. Thank Jeffries, you. you have a comment, and then we're going to have to... Yeah, I'll make it quick. Any other questions for this panel, then we're going to have to move on. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make it quick. In, uh, in my county, uh, one of my two counties, Riverside, Roughly 80, 85 percent of the SRA fires are extinguished by local government before a CAL FIRE unit ever even arrives. So we have to recognize the partnership that has to exist in all of this, and I appreciate the work that you guys are, are doing on that. Uh, m my concern is really uh, in large part about the Forest Service fires that roll out of the federal boundaries and into our state watershed and our state wildlands and the challenges we have with the way Forest Service manages their fires versus the way we manage our fires. And, and my personal experience is there is a dramatic difference in the way we manage fires. Uh, Forest Service is a much more slow, go-at-it approach over a period of days, weeks, because of what they're accustomed to across the country when they bring in their management teams who come from New Mexico and Montana and Wyoming. They just have a different way of fighting large wildland fires than we do. And so we, I've personally experienced and, and watched that conflict occur over, over 29 years of my service. So I appreciate the sensitivity to how we're going to work with other agencies as well. Uh, my two bottom line issues are local control, maintaining respect and, and, and understanding of the, of the sensitivity to local control as we implement new rules and regulations at the state level. I'm already dealing with an issue in San Diego County where a landowner who is a firefighter is being told to put in $350,000 worth of road improvements for her lot that all the other neighbors are, are going to benefit from, uh, and this is as a result of Title 14 uh, state requirements that San Diego County is enforcing on this one <laughs> firefighter who, whose lot is worth about $150,000. The single road improvements are over three hundred thousand um, dollars. Just can't do it, and so the lot's going to become useless. Uh, so it's sort of a de facto taking of someone's land because they now can't use it, uh, at least the way they're proposing to use it. Maybe there's a better uh, another route. Then my my last concern is the delays we experience in vegetation management programs, fire safe councils, and others who are trying to actually implement the thinnings, the defensible space those efforts to protect communities through vegetation management programs taking literally years to get through the environmental review process. If, if we're serious about improving fire protection and, and managing our fires, we're going to have to address a way to expedite vegetation management programs. And some of that is above my pay grade, and I don't have a full amount of understanding of how it all works, but 
it's an issue that I've heard. It, it, and there are some classic examples. Uh, one that I saw in San Diego County where the department worked on a uh, vegetation treatment uh, uh, program, finally made it through all the procedural hurdles just in time to watch it burn up. So I guess, you know, that is a classic example of something like that. On the Title 14, 1270 uh, regulate, fire safe regulations, it's a little bit different than the fire plan because the fire plan is a little bit more strategic, but the board is in the process of reviewing those. Remember that those regulations were adopted uh, over 20 years ago. The situation has changed drastically in terms of the amount of people. At that time, I, I, I would guess there was probably 20 million people in the state, and now we're getting pretty close to 40, 40. 40 million. So. We've got to reassess those, and we and they are a little bit too um, one size fits all. And I think that's what's happening with yeah, this particular, yeah. particular property owner. These problems, these these weren't issues before, uh, because it, we're talking about rural areas where you, it really wasn't a, a big issue. Now it is a big issue. Now right. there's some, there's some significant issues involved with that. I would just comment on, and I'll go to you, uh, Mr. Sturt, in a moment. Uh, I just comment, and then uh, Assembly Member Nava. You know, the intensity of development in the backcountry, which we haven't ad addressed specifically this morning, is putting tremendous pressure on the whole system. And I don't know that person's property, but I know at Wildcat Canyon Road in San Diego County in 03, 13 people died because that road was so inadequate. And the infill development that had happened over the decades. You know, people went out there when it was very rural and had their horses and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now it's more like a suburban level of intensity with inadequate infrastructure top to bottom and we do have a hundred thousand units are in the pipeline right now in high fire hazard severity zones for development in California and we have to figure out a way uh, to either uh, uh, support the tremendous amount of uh, fire protection those new residents are going to need or somehow uh, you know make them safer with building standards or limit uh, the areas in which they can uh, build, even if it's just g the degree of grade that they can be on. Anyway, so Mr. Uh, Stewart, would, very I briefly, would, and then Mr. Yeah, Dunham. very briefly. Uh, in 41 years, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I've been through the thick and thin of this, and I think there is only one approach, and it really is the federal, state, and the local agencies participating in a countywide, so we should work with RCRC and the other organization to get one established and maintained and supported in each each county. And the county fire plan they develop from either the ranger unit plan that CDF has there or the independent plan that they file, when they develop this base map, it shows the projects that they're doing and need to do to get ahead of the fire problem in their county. Then what I suggest this body and at the federal level needs to look at streamlining NEPA and CEQA to allow projects in a county fire plan that's approved by a board of supervisors to move forward with friv without frivolous appeals and lawsuits. In other words, Thank unless you. we do that, the process in place stops these projects that Mr. Jeffords is talking about. I think uh, we need to work science-based analysis into the entire discussion. Mr. Nava? Yeah, that's 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 a fascinating segue into the the, the 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 issues that I wanted to talk about. Looking on page eleven, uh, <clears throat> point two: assist the appropriate governmental bodies in the development of a comprehensive set of wildland and wildland urban interface protection policies. And it seems that that a big part of the problem that we have here is land use mm -hmm. and determinations made by local government about what they think is appropriate land use, even if it means that you're going to be building in the urban wildland interface, thereby increasing the likelihood of some need for assistance in the future when we have the fire in that area. And I, th I just think it's, it's fascinating that, that there's, there's at least two approaches to this, and one of them is, as Mr. Gentry said, you know, let's change NEPA and let's do something with CEQA so that this stuff can move forward as compared to maybe, and maybe I'm not hearing it correctly, about starting back over here and, and figuring out a way that is, you don't get to build there. That's not the right place to put your 6,000 square foot home with your outbuildings and the tennis courts and the rest of the stuff that firefighters are then compelled to protect and to risk their lives. And so... I, I, I'm kind of curious as to whether or not any of you can look to an experience in a jurisdiction 
where there has been science-based determinations with with the county board of supervisors and with the states and the feds that say, you know what, it just doesn't make any sense to approve a development up a road that is inadequate so that your fire trucks can't get up there and turn around uh, and where you have to extend infrastructure so that people have water. Because, you see, from my way, my approach would be you just kind of draw a line and say, guess what, you can't build there. Do some more infill. We understand how much people desire the wilderness experience from the comfort of the leather sofa with the big screen TV and the remote. They want to look out the side at the glass and go, my God, isn't that beautiful forest? Thing? What's that smoke over there? <laughs> right? And that's the dilemma you find yourselves in. And so there has to be a combination of the two. And I'm just curious, have you seen anywhere where you've been able to develop that? Well, I, I can't speak for all, but I could uh, suggest to you that in Plumas County that is being looked at because the Board of Supervisors adopted the county fire plan, which was collaboratively developed, and building structures and home improvement and these kind of standards the boards are looking at. But they also have to look at it from an economic standpoint. When the feds control 90% of your county, they have to look for revenues also. Mr. Yeah, uh, we, uh, of course, have uh, defensible space. Uh, I'm sorry. A general safety plan element guidelines that we issue to uh, all counties when they are reviewing their plan. Now they're not binding on them, but they have but they have a lot of information in them that they need to consider. This comes back to the original point. Nobody's trying to um, usurp county authority, but we are trying to educate them and make them aware that there are consequences for what they decide to do, and and that there are some prudent practices that they need to follow if they're going to continue. So uh, I think Plumas County is a great example. There, there is a, it's, a, it's a really good uh, board of supervisors, a really engaged community, and they have a county forester that really helps keep them on the straight and narrow. Uh, if we could clone that and move that around the state, we'd really have something there. Thank you. I think just um, to go back to Sonia Renava's comment, I think it is critical. It, it's a multifaceted approach that we need to look at this from. Um, absolutely, we need to be engaged in the new development and the land use planning uh, so that we're building smart for the future. But we've also got what's already out there, and we have to embrace and figure out how we're going to continue to deal with that because we've, we've got the continued uh, conflicts between land use policies on, on federal lands that um, Senator Member Jeffries talked about, and we've got this development that had gone on, however it occurred in previous years that are in direct conflict. It's there now. Yeah, and so we, we need to be able to continue to have the ability to treat fuels. We need, you know, um, relief from environmental, uh, you know, to streamline some of these processes so we can get out and treat fuels under the VMP program. We need a strong resource management budget uh, to be able to continue to do those reviews and process that through the department. Again, it comes back to the, the ability to continue to provide the resources. We we'll, need more we'll revenues. Play. Exactly. Key, key. So, bottom uh, line, multifaceted approach. We have to hit it from all angles. Dr. Moritz, I'll give you the closing. Well, thanks. I, I guess I would echo Senator Nava's concerns that that even as even if we were to able able to somehow streamline the environmental review process, and I think a lot of people would question whether that's really the right direction to go. But even if we were able to do that. The continued decision making and development at the local level is going to outpace any sort of catch up and any, any sort of gain we might make, I would argue. I think that between climate change and the continued uh, development and fragmentation, that is always going to keep us behind the curve, if you will, on, on this whole problem. And so when I look at uh, examples that, that may have worked, there are some examples, but they're from other countries, like Australia. They have some much more stringent and top-down approaches to, to some of their development and with respect to fire. But if I look at other natural hazards, if you look at the way we handle earthquakes and where and how we let people do this and that, or wetlands, the cumulative impact of wetlands we now acknowledge is something that we want to track from a, a broader perspective, and we, we impinge on local decision-making with with that in mind. So there are examples from other arenas, I think, that, that could help provide some guidance to, to how we might proceed. Uh, Ma Madam uh, Chairman, it, I, it, it is an injustice to think that we can just put 
moats around the communities and walk away from the problem. That's why a county fire plan is needed. Gotcha. The biggest threat to the domestic Stewart, water supply Stewart, in the state we, of California. Mr. Stewart, thanks. You bet. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, I could spend, you know, all, all of us, I think, a lot more time with you for, uh, really appreciate it, um, but we're going to go on to the next uh, panel. And the, the next panel is Steve Foster, Chief of the Consumnus Fire Department, representing California Fire Chiefs Association, and Michael Endicott, Resources Sustainability Advocate for the Sierra Club. And we're going to have to really uh, keep you two on a tight time uh, constraint. So um, about maximum four minutes each uh, for opening, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you, Senator Kehoe. I'll make my comments brief. Um, Welcome, I have, I, Chief. Appreciate thank you. It. I'm here representing California Fire Chiefs. I have some uh, specific comments on the objectives and some overall comments to make. Um, first of all, I just want to let you know that we are supportive of all the efforts of uh, Cal Fire and everything they do to work with us in a partnership in a synergistic fashion because mutual aid costs, since this time we started talking about this plan, in 2000, 2003, have grown from $18 million to $180 million as we sit here today. So there is definitely a problem out there. Objective number one, we notice that it addresses uh, strictly wildland and does not address all risk categories. And the mission of CAL FIRE uh, has shifted and is not clearly addressed in this strategic plan at all. Um, and that needs to be addressed out there. In objective uh, number two, um, we uh, feel that what we're lacking in this plan is measurable standards of cover. I know you're going to ask me about accountability, but a lot of the uh, local fire agencies have standards of covers uh, documents that uh, set the baseline for what their service needs are. We do not have a statewide standards of cover document, nor do we have a document that uh, works in a synergistic fashion with the local uh, standards of cover documents. Objective number three uh, should include that community wildfire protection plans, CWPPs, should be mandated. Uh, a lot of uh, what we see in this strategic plan skirts around the issue of we should or maybe we should, but doesn't say, you know what, maybe we ought to mandate these in communities so we can have a baseline to work from. Uh, from these planning documents. And also in objective number three. And, and Chief, the, uh, the suggestions you're making today are on behalf of the Fire Chiefs Association? Correct. Good. Thank you. In, in uh, objective number three, um, we have new California building standards that go into effect uh, January 1, 2011, that require every home to be fire sprinklered in California. And the, that is not even addressed in this plan in any way that that's a benefit to what we're trying to do uh, as far as strategic uh, planning and taking the load off of the structural suppression efforts. Also, uh, we have adopted a new wildland urban interface codes as of January 1st, 2011, which again are not addressed in this strategic plan. Objective, objective number four uh, deals with prevention, and we're glad to see that prevention seems to be the, mo the biggest focus of the strategic plan. We think that's where the critical work gets done. But there's cost components that are associated with those prevention efforts, and they're not addressed anywhere in the strategic plan on how we're going to get the dollars in to work on those uh, issues. Um, in addition, in Objective 4, uh, inspections are not mandatory anywhere in this document uh, for defensible space compliance. So again, while we're talking about rising in my world from $18 million to $180 million in mutual aid costs and all the discussion going on, nobody has mandated one set of inspections out there that will be conducted in the state of California for defensible space. I'll skip Objective 5. I find it's appropriate. Objective 6 skirts the issue, again, of statewide standards of cover for CAL FIRE and integration of that plan with other governmental agency standards of covers needs, and it needs to be developed. Furthermore, the Blue Ribbon Task Force recommendations that form the basis for the emergency response initiative in the governor's budget needs to be addressed and funded somehow. <clears throat> and uh, I just have a side note for CAL FIRE, and I talked to them uh, yesterday that uh, using the words uh, develop and ensure should be changed in 
objective six to enhance and develop additional because they do have some policies in place that address some of those issues in in uh, objective number six. And um, we're fully supportive of CAL FIRE's mission and it's all of its efforts. We're proud to partner and support their work and all they do to protect the citizens and property. And with that, I'll conclude my comments and take any questions you might have. Thank you so much for your uh, brevity, uh, Chief. I really appreciate it. Uh, the, was the Fire Chiefs Association on the steering committee? No. Would you care to comment on that? I don't think we got invited. Nobody, nobody asked you? No. That's, that's no fun. Um, I wonder if uh, the steering committee would consider uh, in future efforts um, looking at uh, the deputy director and the board of Mr. Gentry from yeah, what, why the fire chiefs aren't on there. Be, these, these seem like solid recommendations. Let's go to our next speaker, and then we'll, re, we'll ask the whole panel questions. And it's, again, everyone, we're going to have to be brief now because we're getting towards the end. I, uh, the meeting's going to end at 1145. Uh, Mr. Endicott. Uh, good day, Madam Chair, and um, I'll take the Chief's comments and some of yours that you made early on in the introduction as take cross off some of mine, and I'll try to keep it very short, too, but it'll also mean I'll be jumping around and speaking in bullets, probably, rather than setting the context. And to that extent, I'm going to take a, an approach where um, many, most of the speakers here have acknowledged that fire in California is an integral part and is a natural disturbance that we have to expect here in California and that we can't get rid of. Um, so it is also important that uh, Dr. Moritz, and I passed out one of his papers. It's very short in the packet. It's the last one, and everybody should read that if they haven't yet. I think it is additionally inf informational and fills in sort of what was an interesting introduction to this uh, strategic plan. But he talks about a risk-based framework is in appropriate and necessary in this case. And you need to balance the idea that a one-time solution, while it isn't a solution, but a one-time response such as upgrading the, uh, the houses and the materials that you have to use is much, is much more efficient than going back in a few management program over and over again in terms of dollar value overall. And we also need to make sure the strategic plan is distinguishing between the ecosystems as they're very different in their terms of their response in a fire regime. And I think that needs to be made much more explicit in the plan. I think also that CAL FIRE actually has two components to it, and one of the things we were worried about in the name change, although we still refer to it often as the Department of Forestry, is that they have an ecosystem responsibility and a public trust responsibility. And that also weighs in and should be an explicit part of this, uh, this program. And it, you need an explicit recognition of the ecosystem services and habitat values, including biodiversity, uh, the nature of uneven uh, aged trees or forest management practices, um, and I would suggest those go into, for instance, Objective 1, where you're talking about maps, Objective 3, where they're talking about plans, Objective 6B, and Objective 7G. A terrible way to talk to you, but of course it cuts through uh, some of the noise. I just want to get to the fact that we need to have much more explicit recognition, even at this 50,000, 20,000 foot level, of the ecosystem services that are provided here. And I go, you know, in one way, I'm speaking in bullets, and I'm going to be hypercritical of the effort they're trying to do as you try to put one of these together. But if you look in the definitions, for instance, of fuels reduction projects. The, the program really call, refers to everything as fuel focus. It's on uh, page 19. And here the definition is very interesting to me. It says the modification of vegetation in order to reduce potential fire threat. And then there's a sentence which has nothing to do to me in the traditional definitional sense. It says these projects often result in improved wildlife habitat uh, capability, timber growth, and or forage production. That's an observational thing, not a definition. And I think in what they're trying to do there is by including it in this definition is make it a part of the strategic vision. But it's buried here, and I think it's not because it's not explicitly recognized in here, and when you talk about we're going to value assets, it disappears. So there needs to be an official you know, recognition of those asset values. <clears throat> and have a metrics also not only for how are you actually achieving fuel reduction, but what are you doing in terms of enhancing those um, environmental and ecosystem services. Um, I guess uh, one of the things, too, is one of the biggest problems with fire is where it intersects, and fire is a part of nature, with the you know urban interface and homes, and that's why there have been efforts, they keep saying, come back to the legislature for more money. But one of the big problems, I think we need to go more to the governor to get him to sign some of the key 
recommendations that you're talking about. The chair uh, and Assemblymember Jones have all have gone repeatedly. It looks like a, a, an awful sort of timber harvest right there um, in SB 505, AB 666, SB 1500, AB 2447, and I'm glad the chair is back again to try and get at this planning incorporation part of it that make it incorporated into the, uh, the process. And with more explicit a recognition of the ecosystem services, and if we really actually had more enforceable planning, I think you could find more cooperation between all of us about what you could do for streamlining. But if we treat these as small little boxes, when you if you just start streamlining willy-nilly, you may not have any real fire uh, redu um, danger reduction, and you may have large ecosystem damage in impacts, both from the fires itself, but also from the responses or trying to reduce the fuel loading. Um, I, uh, Senator Gilmore had talked about last year's uh, forestry bill, and I think he was talking about AB 1066. We're, not, we're totally sensitive to the economic issues that are involved here, but we viewed AB 1066 actually as an ability to slow down harvest. What it did was allow you to extend the validity period of your timber harvest plan, not speed up harvest. So I think it actually is more reflective of what the er economic circumstances are that are hitting our state now in the forestry area. Um, I think that's, uh, I guess I can cut it off there so you can try and catch up and get to your, your end deadline and answer specific questions, except for I'd like to just say one more thing. There is, when you talk about in integrating it with, um, with uh, carbon sequestration principles and all, I think it is good to be thinking about that. But that I would just say is that not all carbon sequestration offsets are equal, and not even within the forestry sector, not all carbon sequestration uh, principles are equal. Uh, there's no doubt about it that, as uh, uh, George Gentry said early on, that cooperation sort of is key to this, and if people don't cooperate, uh, you won't get very far. Um, on the other hand, and so touching on some of these forestry-related issues um, can be very dicey. It brings up lots of feelings and emotions. But we can't just go after the land use planning. You also have to look at forest management practices as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, first, I want to welcome Assemblymember Block and Assemblymember Uber. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Um, just to go back to Chief Foster for a minute, um, uh, I really appreciate your comments uh, and I would love to see uh, you know, a stronger stance on uh, many of the issues you mentioned, particularly on the land use issues, uh, addressed in the strategic plan. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the draft plan offers a viable strategy for um, of prevention and suppression given uh, the budget challenges that you locals are facing? Well, I, this is a 10-year plan, and the last plan, it was 10 years plus another, um, what, five or six years? Yeah, probably. 96 to... So, you know, we're dealing with 15-year spans. Yes, we're in an economic recession right now, but we're talking about long-range planning in everything we do. Um, I think um, what we need to do is get back to the basics, and I appreciate all the science, and I have a degree in environmental science, so I understand all that. But what I'm talking about here is baseline strategies. Without a predetermined standards of cover, which we have in draft form already through the Blue uh, Ribbon Fire Commission's Task Force for Urban Wildland Interface, without adopting these kinds of standards, when you talk about accountability and what we're going to do as far as goals and strategies, we've got nothing to base anything on. And so what's the, what's the uh, obstacles to adopting? Budget? I, I don't think that's it staffing. at all. Staffing? No, I think it's about taking Inertia? a document that's very um, – skirts the issues, and let's put the issues in that are the issues. The main issue is the main issues. Our forests are burning. Um, something's changed in the environment. I think we could agree uh, with the Sierra Club on that. And we need, do need to work together to continue to make this front end preloaded with fire prevention strategies, but also deal with the uh, suppression end in a focused manner uh, that could work for everybody. And until we adopt statewide standards of cover, either by unit or county or whatever, and we integrated that with the locals, because we're all integrated now, your fire service is the cheapest in the nation through the Master Mutual Aid Plan, which is tending to fall apart right now. Um, because of revenue issues, mm -hmm. uh, if we could just get focused on what those standards of cover are and then work towards getting them funded somehow in the next, I'm assuming it will be 18 years before we review <coughs> this document again, perhaps in that There's time frame we could... lots of ideas out there. It's just a matter of getting support. That's right. Lots of ideas out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, Mr. Anacott, I'll just ask you a, kind of a broad-based question. Do you see in the strategic plan um, enough... Uh, 
uh, protection of uh, biodiversity and natural resources uh, in, in the policies? No, I think that, that that really needs to be a focus and needs to be added in here. And I think that's partly in the definition of what is an asset, because people understand what a building is, people understand what a water tower is, um, but they may, they may not understand really how important biodiversity is and the interaction between that, not only for the actual animals itself that might live there, and some of them actually benefit from a fire, so that if you suppress the fire too much, you actually create a change in that circumstance. The second part of it, too, is, is that it's very important to know and have metrics that you can talk about in terms of how this would affect resiliency of the forest because different practices and different clearance structures would have an effect on that as well. And then the last piece I would have is that in terms of the integration, there is a sort of strategic adaptation plan that California is also simultaneously trying to develop, but it really needs much, it sort of flies between, I think, what this is strategy document and then the next level down, but it's still not at the bottom level. The bottom level is what you've been trying to do, which is fix planning start getting a jump on that because it is 15 years. That can fill in a lot of space and create a lot more problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Block, uh, Ms. Huber, or any other members? Any comments? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Nava? If I, if I may, because I've got um, an appointment. Um, I'm in, in looking at the um, this draft report, um, on, on what page would I find the participants? People actually sat around the table and had this conversation. Is it in here? It's in, it's, it's in your packet, it, but it's not in the draft report. Okay. It's not so, in the strategic plan, but here they are. Okay, so so Dr. Moritz was part of the people who got to sit down and actually take a look at how this thing was coming together. Because I, I, I do think that the issue of the application of science is one that okay. could level um, a certain amount of controversy among the participants. Um, as a member of the Ocean Protection Council, I thought that we made some tremendous strides when we incorporated scientists um, as part of the conversation in reviewing plans so we'd have some sense of consequences and also some, some idea of unintended consequences. Because I think once you have a scientific analysis that is legitimate as compared to some of the others that we've seen in other parts of our lives, um, then it really tends to focus the conversation on what's practical. Um, and what makes sense um, uh, with science. Because I do think that 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 <clears throat> a lot of what we talk about is, uh, is fire prevention and suppression, but some of the significant details uh, in that have to do and, and, and need to be fleshed out more about the scientific approach mm -hmm. to habitat, habitat protection, um, and restoration once you have the fire. And I think that that's a part of this that, that desperately needs to be improved. You know, we probably uh, should do a hearing uh, right on that point and ask uh, the fire professionals to respond and fire safe councils and folks like that. Uh, thank you for your comments, Mr. Navin. Thank you thank for you. your attention this morning. We're going to uh, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to panel three, uh, which is um, Vince Webster, fire chief of uh, City of Fairfield, right up the road. And uh, even a little bit further, uh, Diane Dillon, Napin County Supervisor, uh, representing the Regional Council of Rural Counties, and the Fire Chief is representing uh, the California League of Cities. And you're going to talk about how the plan will aid local governments in their fire prevention and uh, protection efforts. Uh, Chief Webster, will tar start with you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Committee members, uh, Vince Webster, City of Fairfield Fire Department Fire Chief. I also represent the League of California Cities, and I'm here to speak on, uh, just as you mentioned, Madam Chair, how this uh, plan um, uh, will uh, will uh, be supported and how it will affect local government. And I first need to say, you know, the League uh, strongly supports activities that bring about improved land use policies throughout the state. Um, that's what we're about. We, we respond proactively and reactively to, to fires. Um, I am uh, sensitive to the point that was mentioned uh, as to whether or not there is a, a uh, league fire department representative on the steering committee. I do not know the answer to that today. Um, I, I will find out. <laughs> and I think I did see somebody from the League of Cities here, or did I? No. I guess not. So I, I guess not which is, again, um, an oversight that needs to be corrected. Uh, the challenge always is, 
a committee that is able to get the work done um, and is effective and focused and one that's broad enough to represent all the different aspects in the state. But I do think it needs some, I do think it needs some review and we'll ask CAL FIRE and the Board of Forestry to look at that. We also note the Board of Forestry, my understanding is has no fire representative. Uh, and you know, one of the things that comes out of this uh, strategic plan is the need for more formal collaboration and communication between the agencies. <clears throat> and I know that's a challenge between getting it so big, it's cumbersome, uh, or uh, having people operate in silos where uh, no one knows what the next, the next uh, agency department or, or, or silo is doing. So, but go ahead, continue, it's your time. Okay, I, I, and I understand that. I, I, I'm not necessarily advocating that a representative be on the committee, just perhaps uh, that, that there's a, uh, more outreach. And, I, and I'll follow up with you know, the cohorts from the league to, to see if there was a good collaboration or not. Uh, the other uh, component that I wanted to just briefly comment on is it's very key, and I'm sensitive to the comments that were made about including local government or being respective of local government control. Um, we definitely want to make sure that this collaboration respects local government control. Um, having said that, though, in my opinion, the CAL FIRE strategic plan does parallel our goals in the, in, in the area of fire safety, fire protection, uh, and prevention. As a result, uh, the long term would result in a decrease in the fire exposure threat. Uh, and in, Cal in our opinion, and, I, and I'm speaking from the Solano County area specifically, CAL FIRE is often referred to as the model agency uh, when it comes to wildland fire response and tactics. I appreciate their efforts when they come in for mutual aid. They're very um, aggressive yet safe. Uh, and so we, we, we respect them for that. Um, our experience with CAL FIRE is that we have state responsibility areas close by. Uh, and as I said, we rely on them pretty regularly for automatic aid and, and uh, uh, mutual aid. I'm encouraged specifically by, um, by the objectives as they, as they have listed them in a report. and. Um, I know that there are some concerns as to whether or not uh, those were specific enough, but establishing and administering forest and rangeland policy, protecting and represents this, representing the state's interest, I do want to, again, make sure that we're talking about local government being inclusive of that, uh, provide direction and guidance to the director, and accomplish a comprehensive regulatory program, conducting its duties, et cetera. All of those we support wholeheartedly. Again, I just can't stress enough to make sure that local government and our uh, rights and responsibilities are, are, are respected. Again, uh, the proactive stance in mitigating fires is a great benefit to us and the local government. Um, as a result, we get less, a, a decreased threat to um, our borders from state responsibility area fires. That's huge for us. We have enough problem uh, with the mitigation inside our borders, let alone the threat from outside of our borders. So any efforts to, to mitigate fires in the state responsibilities area, state responsibility areas we support. Another huge issue for us is the increased amount of money that we're spending on mutual aid fires throughout the state. We're part of the state master mutual aid agreement. We find our personnel going up and down the state on strike teams on a regular basis. As was noted, 2008 was a very, very significant year for us. Uh, even though we get reimbursement from the California um, uh, Calima, uh, it's, it's still we have internal challenges because we have backfill problems, et cetera, because we have a lot of folks going throughout the state. We wholeheartedly support that um, and we'll do what we can staffing wise, but any efforts to decrease that, uh, the amount of strike teams that we're responding on is huge for us. And lastly, uh, we definitely support CAL FIRE's efforts as, as uh, briefly outlined in the report to um, determine their appropriate level of fire suppression resources in initial attack. Initial attack is, uh, in our opinion, huge. You, you catch the fire while it's small, um, and hence, you know, you decrease the chance of the fire turning into a conflagration. So we support CAL FIRE's efforts to take care of their appropriate staffing levels uh, in, in the manner that they can. And I realize this is a challenging uh, environment economically wise. And with that, I'll conclude my comments and answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. We'll uh, hear from Supervisor Dillon, then we'll ask both of you together. But I know I'll be starting with the land use question, so you can collect your thoughts. <laughs> Supervisor Dillon, welcome. Well, oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, on behalf of the Regional Council of Rural Counties, also known as RCRC. 
and uh, offer a little government, local government perspective. And I believe you have a written uh, copy of, of we do my remarks. And so there's always a benefit to going last, and that's that you get to hear all these other comments. And so I've, 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 I'm going to talk about something almost totally different than what's in, in, in this, except I would like to review uh, uh, five particular points. I really think that um, how the fire plan will help local government is reflected in goals three and four. Um, when it talks about um, supporting collaborative development and implementation of wildland fire protection and increasing awareness. And we would really encourage CAL FIRE to participate in project level land use planning review at the local and city county level um, in subdivision design, including but not limited to road improvements, interconnectivity, unobstructed fire access, fuels reduction, and water availability. Um, we also, you know, there's some very practical things that we can do, and I, 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 it's regrettable that Assemblymember Nava had to leave because he was talking about practical things and commonsensical things that could be done. And, you know, a very basic thing is, um, you know, the inability of small counties in particular um, and counties, almost all counties now with budget reductions, to do things like detailed vegetation and fuel and fire risk maps. And those are things, um, web applications and GIS, um, if we could share those things from the state um, coming, you know, help providing that to us, and I'm not talking about increased expense, but simply sharing what they already have and are developing, that's a pretty simple um, thing to do. We would like to see greater prioritization of fuels management and a strong commitment at the state level to work closely with federal agencies and local governments. Several times in, in the fire plan, it mentions about how, um, for instance, 80% um, of the um, uh, the federal um, of the lands are um, 80 percent of the state's water originates in forested watersheds and um, I don't have to tell you that a lot of that land is federal land um, and as a, a first vice chair of RCRC um, I've been tasked with one of our main goals which is increased collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service now we don't have U.S. Forest Service lands in Napa County but in in 29 of the 31 RCRC counties we do. Um, and it is a, it, it's a huge concern to us to be able to do projects um, next to forest lands. Um, and so we really need better cooperation. So the Fire Safe uh, Council's comments on local, state, and federal collaborations for fire planning at the local level, is, that rings true to you? It does. Okay. Um, and we need to we need a higher level of assertiveness within the U.S. Forest Service. I was in Washington D.C. two weeks ago and spent time visiting U.S. Forest Service, USDA folks, saying we need uh, you know, we need to have a better operation of U.S. Forest Service um, uh, at the in California in particular. But but I wanted I wanted to uh, just briefly take that, that's a budget that has been slashed tremendously. It's it's unfortunate, but. If, but I, I just wanted to go back to a couple of other comments that were made earlier about 100,000. You, you may have said that. 100,000 homes are in the pipeline, I believe. Um, I did say that. I would submit that most of those homes are not in the 31 counties that are the RCRC counties. We don't have huge subdivisions proposed for the most part in our counties. Um, and we have our, con our concern is our existing communities. Um, in my county, the communities that were, and this is, true for most of the 31 RCRC counties, the communities that have existed for 50, 100, 150 years. Retrofitting existing stock. Well, and providing defensible space. We That's talk right. about science. Mm -hmm. We have science. I mean, after the 91 Oakland Hills fire, all the studies that were done that, that out of which resulted the defensible space rules. And uh, the chief, um, chief Foster mentioned um, that he wasn't aware of any... Um, local program, and I just wanted to tell you what we've done in Napa County. Um, two years ago, we passed a local ordinance, and we require defensible space. And there was um, mention of the fire, spending a, a $1 billion on fire. Well, if you gave every county $200,000, that would be $11,400,000, and they'd still have $989 million left of the $1 billion. But with $200,000, you can go out and hire a wood chipper. You can have your uh, folks who are guests in your jail go out uh, supervised and handle the wood chipping program. And um, you have a person goes around and inspects for defensible space and issues citations. We have had an extremely successful program in Napa County. We have had people um, 
welcome us onto their land, say, we didn't know what we were supposed to do about defensible space. So it gives us an opportunity to educate. Now, I'm by Very no good. means suggesting that this should be a state mandate unless there's funding. We chose as a board of supervisors to fund that. But if you, uh, you know, it is possible to do this with a little bit of funding. So there are practical programs out there um, that can result. And in closing, um, I've been a member of the Sierra Club since 1982. I agree with almost all of, personally, with almost all of Mr. Endicott's um, remarks. And I would like to suggest that on page 19, where he suggested that... Uh, of his report or of the plan? Good. Of the plan. Thank you for sticking with the plan. That, um, the glossary. The glossary. If you simply change that to say fuels reduction and forest enhancement projects was the term, and then you said the modification of vegetation in order to reduce potential fire threat and improve wildlife habitat capability, <coughs> timber growth, and forage production. That's my thank personal you. recommendation. I'll take that under advisement. Um, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. The, uh, you've mentioned some specific land use uh, steps and um, fuels management. Uh, what like let me tell me a little bit more about uh, what each of your local jurisdictions do uh, on uh, permitting development in high fire hazard severity zones. We work with our local. We have a contract with Cal Fire. We don't have that's our Napa County Fire Department. Got it. And so we work with them. And when someone comes in for a new winery or a home out in the hills, um, they they determine what um, mitigations are needed. Be it um, uh, a water tank, building a wider standard. road, uh, building standards. Um, everyone is now by state law required to, to build to cer certain new standards in terms of defensible space. So uh, the county has the CAL FIRE to look at the safety, the fire safe element. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any zoning restrictions uh, based on high fire hazard severity zones or anything like that? Okay. No. Thank you. We have 40 sure. acre minimums on the valley floor and 160 acre minimums in the hills. Now that doesn't mean there aren't one acre parcels that exist. Um, but we have homes going into places where there's not high density uh -huh. and we have knock on wood not have had any problems. Right. Knock on wood indeed. Because, <laughs> because uh, even those big spreads, uh, you know, you still have firefighters out at the end of a long road protecting a million dollar home for uh, a great expense to the taxpayers. Two years ago, we put in a sprinklering rule before Good. the state. I, it, we have not seen these challenges um, as as noted in other parts of the lucky, state. Lucky, lucky you. Yeah. So lucky I, you. I think there's a way to do it. Chief, are things as good in Fairfield? Well, um, first off, uh, in Solano County, we don't have the, uh, I'd say, the, the high density in terms of the forested areas. We have more moderate, light, flashy fuels. Uh, but we do have twin sisters. We have some areas where we have some open space concerns. But to answer your question earlier about what sort of restrictions are in place, uh, we typically mirror the CAL FIRE's role. Um, they're, they're advocating, actually they're requiring 100 foot clearance uh, you know, around the structure. And we do that as much as we can within the city of Fairfield. We're limited to 30 feet at this point, um, but we try to advocate 100 feet clearance around the structures outside of the city. Uh, we also um, are beginning to implement in some of our cities the uh, uh, homeowner education plan that includes the chipper plan that Napa um, does. We're, th we're trying to use them as a model in terms of educating our residents because yeah. that's clearly where it starts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Members, uh, comments or questions for the panel? Um, uh, I, I want to thank, thank you both. Um, and uh, just uh, we've learned a lot this morning. Uh, there's just only one uh, public comment uh, from uh, Joe Raw Weitzer. So I'll thank you, uh, thank you. both for uh, helping us. And we'll listen to um, the uh, public comment. Joe, yeah, tell me your last name. All righty. Yeah, have a seat and tell us briefly what uh, your comments are. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman, committee members. Um, I'm coming from uh, Monterey San Benito County. Uh, I'm a project coordinator in a fire safe council um, and have been in that role for over 10 years. I'm also a retired 
uh, Cal Fire Fire Captain from a long time ago. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, you have a, a, my written comments, uh, but what I would we like do. to do is just hit some bullet points based on what I've witnessed here today. Uh, the first item um, I'd like to talk about is there was some discussion earlier um, about what the uh, fire plan document really is. Um, we heard uh, from uh, Chief Pimlot that uh, it was a 50,000 foot view, uh, not intended necessarily to be a action document that could be used at a community or unit level. Um, we really believe that if this document is not something that can be either a blueprint or a roadmap at the local and unit level, uh, it's not going to work. We have to have the top to bottom integration. Okay. It can't be a 50,000 foot view. <clears throat> um, also, the other th another comment I heard was that <clears throat> um, there, we have an all risk fire department. <clears throat> Cal Fire's primary responsibility is wildland. It is the, the, to protect the people and the resource. And what we're witnessing is a dilution of fire in favor of non-fire responsibilities. And this is impacting and causing uh, costs to rise. It's causing the disconnect at the local level when we try to get projects done uh, in communities, uh, fuel modification products, projects done, uh, vegetation management program project requests. We don't have time, we don't have money, we don't have the people because we're busy doing non-fire activities. What are those non-fire activities? Emergency medical response oh, okay. is 90% of it. Okay. Um, it's, it's, th those should be on the list, but what's happening statewide and what's happening in our local area is the, um, historically, it was a, it was a fire primarily a fire response unit, right. but today all of the emphasis is in the north part of our county and the high Pebble Beach and Carmel area where the high values are. And, where you're acting as an And the other two and a half million acres is uh, just out there waiting okay. for a wildfire to happen. Good point. I understand. The other comment I heard was that uh, in this document they looked at living with fire, but what the document at the draft at this point, it's really a suppression only document. It doesn't uh, address proactive management. I think we've heard enough from others today about that aspect, but I wanted to emphasize that. Um, my last point is that any funding, we need funding for this, and to continue to provide funding for suppression at all costs, blank check firefighting is a dead end road. Uh, what we're doing is we're limiting fire on the landscape out there right now in state responsibility area to the 4% of fires that escape initial attack. The state is about 96% effective at initial attack. So the only time the landscape's gonna burn is under the worst conditions. This might be called the perfect firestorm because what, we, what we're doing is we're being required to fund, staff, and respond to the worst case scenario. So we need to reverse that. We need that change. And this document is where that change needs to be reflected. Good points. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, all the panelists. We really appreciate your time. I know some of you traveled to be here. Um, I uh, want to just say uh, that um, the draft strategic plan uh, is proposed to guide the state's fire prevention and fire suppression activities until uh, the next update in 12, 2018. Uh, so this morning we wanted to highlight the plan and its draft state. Uh, it is important that this document be as comprehensive as possible. I will be commenting uh, before uh, April 5th, which is the close of comments. So those of you in the public who want to um, comment, do it before then. Um, I'll be specifically commenting on the need for uh, a formal uh, review between uh, the, the draft plan and other state agencies. Uh, we've learned a lot from the testimony. Uh, we uh, want a document to be as comprehensive as possible, as I said, and to incorporate uh, the best science and the lessons uh, learned uh, and best management practices that fire professionals and fire scientists have been recommending since 2003 and before, actually. Um, again, I encourage you to submit your recommendations uh, by April 5th. That is the deadline. Um, I really believe the residents of our state uh, deserve the best efforts in ensuring a strategic 
plan for fire suppression and prevention that works for all of us. Um, thank you again, members. I really appreciate your attention and uh, the time you spent here today uh, and to staff for all the preparation and especially to the panelists. We couldn't do it without the information you bring to us. Um, thank you again. The hearing's adjourned. Thank you.